Hey everyone, David Chen here. Severance season one, the finale just aired, and boy, was it an incredible season of television, a great finale. I was really excited to talk about it, and so I brought in uh, my colleague and friend, Miles McNutt, uh, to talk about this season of television, what questions it answered, what questions we are looking forward to, what our hopes, fears, and dreams are for season two. It was a great chat. Uh, tons of spoilers, but be sure to check out Miles' Substack newsletter, Episodic Medium. He's one of the smartest writers about television that I know uh, on the internet. So again, check it out at episodicmedium.substack.com. I'll put a link in the description below. Also, if you enjoy this video, be sure to hit like and subscribe uh, and hit that bell icon to get notifications for new videos. I publish a lot of stuff about TV, film, and tech uh, with recaps, reviews, and stuff like that. So hope you enjoy this video. Thanks for watching. And here's my conversation with Miles McNutt about Severance Season 1. I want to start by saying overall, I thought this is one of the best seasons of sci-fi television I've ever seen. Certainly one of the best debut seasons of sci-fi television. Uh, Mostly because the just on a pure craft executional level, I think they really pulled this off. They created this world. It's extremely uh, visually distinctive. If I can say something is extremely visually distinctive, I don't know if that makes sense. But uh, and it made me think about you know the nature of work, the nature of what it means to be human. Uh, is it your memories that make who you are? You know, and I think the show's answer to that question is yes. Uh, and so it's extremely thought provoking. Season one finale was just an exceptional hour of it was forty minutes, but an exceptional forty minutes of storytelling, mostly taking place in real time. Uh, and it's just extremely tense. It's uh, you were really like on the edge. Of, like for much of the episode, I felt like I was holding my breath. And there's many revelations that are had. Uh, so I really enjoyed the season one finale. What were your overall thoughts, Miles? And then let's talk about what's happened. What happened? Um, I think the finale is a this is like a little stroke of masterpiece. This sort of like you know bit of tension and you know struggle. And I think to your point, like early on, what I identified was like the themes are super resonant, right? Like you know Dan Erickson, who created the show, has talked about how you know for the most part, you know he didn't really realize how like trenchant it was going to be. Like inevitably, like, you know, to know he was going to be creating and writing a show that would sit at this moment where we're talking about the nature of work and remote work and all these kind of different pieces that kind of bring all these things together. But it was also, like you say, the production design and the craft of it. There's just something so striking about it. And so I think what the finale embodies is all those ideas coming to life in these characters in such a tense moment, well realized. I thought the editing in the finale was particularly thrilling in terms of how they can piece these stories together, when to make the move, how to transition the use yeah. of the sound effects, the use of the kind of shifts. The show's editing has always been very striking, but I thought in the finale, yes. it really sort of came to bear on the story that was being told. You're trying to balance these four separate stories in a way that you never have to really had to before in the rest of the season because they're all kind of the innies are all out in the world and you need to like maintain stakes for each one it's very challenging what they did also got to shout out the score by Theodore Shapiro very beautiful very evocative yes uh and just really helps to keep that tension going also so, particularly in the finale the fact that the score is gradually building the show's theme song um, and kind yes. of working to that point that eventually when Cobell arrives at Lumen, we hear the full kind of like soundtrack come in. Right. And it's just like, so I've been, I've been listening to the soundtrack as I've been writing about it. And it's just like yeah. to have those sort of moments come through. It is just this really great piece of craft. I do think that my central and we'll kind of go into this and move through yeah. is that like, I think this was a great end to what I consider to be sort of like a pilot season, which is to say yes. that like now I feel like the show is really starting that they have now mm -hmm. fully laid mm -hmm. these sets. They've developed these characters. I'm not suggesting nothing was accomplished. I think there's sort of like a tendency in the online discourse now to suggest where it's like, oh, we didn't get big answers or anything. I'm like, I didn't need that. But I do think it did leave me with the feeling that we spent nine episodes really establishing the stakes and these circumstances. And now we're going to go kind of start the version of the show that kind of has everything all working towards the same goals and kind of pushing forward. I'm really excited about what that show looks like, but I do think that elements of how this finale played out maybe played into the idea that they're withholding um, some of these big pieces in a way I do think naturally creates some tension with the audience. Let's talk about what was revealed 
right? Uh, so the biggest reveal, and I think you and I saw this coming, right? Uh, was that Heli R is actually Heli Egan, the granddaughter of Kier, the founder of Lumen Industries. Uh, and so she she's clearly like kind of involved in Lumen in some way. And then we found out this episode that uh, the extent of which was like pretty intense. Um, I am curious, you know, so I watched the entire first season in like literally 48 hours. <laughs> uh, and then I rewatched the finale before I had this conversation with you. What were some of the signs where you felt like, oh, the show is dropping hints that Heli is kind of involved with this whole thing? I mean, I think for me, it's sort of going back, like, you know, when we first, I will say, if you go back to the second episode where we see her severance process, I don't think there's a lot there to indicate it. I think they're trying to trying to avoid showing their hand. She just seems like a fairly normal employee. Um, I think that as things go on, though, the moment that most stands out was when she submits her resignation request and it comes mm -hmm. back so quickly even Mark is just like, it's never happened that fast before, right? right. It gives the indication. Well, and then the extremely dickish tone that her Audi right. responded to her, it's like, huh, that's really, wh who would have the boldness to talk to themselves in that way, right? And I think it's the issue though, is that we don't have enough data to determine for certain how distinct that is, right? Mark's kind of yes. gives us an indication of it, but realistically, we don't know. Like in my view, maybe that's just part of the strategy. They have to have the Audis talk that way. Like just sort of like the way in which they move through. I left it open that Heli was just like, really important in some way to her job to what she did at lumen right that there was something that it wasn't necessarily that type of connection it was obviously that she her reasons for severance were a big mystery right in the sense of just like why and like that goes for every character because we know marks so distinctly the show establishes a clear reason why he did this and we're naturally meant to ask why are others doing the same and Heli's obviously most foregrounded in that. We saw her intake process. We see her in the stairwell during that second episode. So yeah. like, I really don't want to be in there, do I? And just kind of like that dynamic. When you eventually get to that moment, you're like, okay, maybe she just like really believes in her work, right? Maybe she's just like really dedicated. Maybe Lumen's told her she's saving the world and she just really cares about that. But like that moment in episode eight where you see her in cocktail attire, and it's just a very yes. brief moment in that context. I immediately am just like, context, she's at the gala. She has something to do with Lumen. But I don't right. think there's anything in the season that would lead you to believe she is actually an Egan outright. I do think so, that is legitimately a finale reveal for me. Yeah, yeah. I think that's I think that's true. I mean, uh, I, I watched with a couple of friends, including my wife, and she kind of called that she was somehow involved with the Egans. And I think the reason for that is... Uh, number one, she's the only person who we don't see anything of her outside of the, you know, the Enies prior to the last episode or, you know, and prior to episode eight. Right. So it's kind of like, hmm, why is the show not showing us anything about her unless they're saving it for this big reveal? And what could be a bigger reveal than that? She's actually part of Lumen in some way. Right. Uh, and then the other thing was like Patricia Arquette's character, Cobell, like keeping her uh, attempted uh, offing of herself a secret certainly that's something that she could do to just try to cover her ass but the way that it was talked about made it feel like there's something more important about this character than just she's a random person that tried to off herself you know what i'm saying like um so you're, but you're right nothing like specifically revealed that it's like an egan-esque character or an egan lineage character until the finale uh an extremely effective reveal I loved the, uh, I think in your write-up at Episodic Medium, you described it as like dystopian when she walks into the room, the massive set with like rotating, mm. uh, which honestly reminds, rotating like large displays, which honestly reminded me a lot of an Apple store, um, just in terms of its aesthetic. And I thought the most brilliant thing about it was you see all this very stylish black and white photography that seems to be like derived from the photos that Milchek has been taking all season. Yeah. Uh, you've been wondering, like, what, what is the purpose yeah. of those photos? And, like, now you see it, and it's like, oh, my gosh, what an amazing moment of, like, realization of what this has all been building up to. It's it's wonderful when a TV can give you that that kind of catharsis or, like, realization, you it's, know? It's a great feeling, I think, to come to the end of the season. That's where it's sort of, like, if people are arguing this is unsatisfying in some way, I'd argue it really wraps up 
the journeys of these characters incredibly effectively. And so to be able to see sort of like this is Heli's intake journey and then sort of like her subsequent sort of realization and sort of for each of these innies to have sort of come to terms with and really change their perspective that we see very clearly, like this is a perfectly normal office when this show starts. Right. Those innies, Mm -hmm. you know, until PD's departure disrupts things. Right. They are just kind of going about their normal days with none of these things going through. And I think there's sort of like this beautiful dramatic irony that Helly's attempt to sort of fix severance and to create this PR moment also disrupts the entire experiment, whatever they're exactly trying to work on. And that, you know, their effort to sort of like expand this creates this unrest that they're not aware of and they're kind of wrestling with. And yet, so to see that version of events, right, to see that propaganda that she just has to walk into that, like, you know, I I knew from the previous episode, like she's going to be in a compromised situation. But I don't think I realized, again, the level of dystopia, the level that they would kind of move through. It's really Mm -hmm. it's a beautiful image, but it's also just a very satisfying sort of like, like you say, the photos, everything connects. And then it's sort of that question of that moment of connection creates a really, I think, an emotional catharsis. But I do feel like for some people, catharsis is tied less to like revelations that are about narrative structure and more to revelations that are about like foundational mystery questions. And I feel like the Mm, separation between those two things is a delicate balance. I think what you're speaking to is the fact that like a lot of people will be very unsatisfied with the finale because it it leaves on such a big cliffhanger, right? I, I personally also agree with you um, in the sense that I found season one to be enormously satisfying as a season of television. And yes, there's a massive cliffhanger. Yes, there's like all, all these other mysteries yet to be resolved, but like that's quote unquote normal for a TV show. I, I would not be happy if they resolve no mysteries, but they resolve some pretty big mysteries. And I feel like that's what great television does is it like answers a lot of questions, makes you feel satisfied and then leaves a bunch of other open questions. And I think season one of severance accomplished this. And I think the challenge so is that I don't disagree with you, but I also think it's a challenge if you don't control which mysteries people care more about. Right. And the reality is that severance chose severance chose chaos, right? They chose to throw a lot of things at the wall and to introduce a lot of different sort of open questions and also to keep the very premise of like, severance and what lumen does as sort of like this beacon of this like we don't know what we're doing we don't know what we're doing we hear it all the time right what do you even do down there right like what's really going on and the uncertainties around that and this empty speculation and sort of like obviously i'm wearing a lost t-shirt today that is not a coincidence um in context (laughs) because every time we talk about these things we talk about lost and it becomes this never-ending snake eating its tail and what i take away from that though is that like you know, even something like the baby goats, where I'm just like, that's the polar bears, right? That's that mm-hmm. like on, you know, this thing you cannot explain that has no easy explanation that as soon as you enter it, there is going to be a subsection of viewers who are just going to be like the baby goats. What is going on with the baby goats? You need to answer the baby goats. You can't give us the baby goats and make us wait an entire year to sit there hoping you will eventually answer the question of the baby goats. And then you're eventually going to answer the question of the baby goats. And you're not even going to notice it's the answer because they're not going to make it be some huge thing. It's just some random mm-hmm. coincidence, which is how the polar bear thing happened on Lost and nobody even noticed. At the end of the day, if you introduce those elements, if you play in that sandbox, you are inevitably going to create a moment where a certain section of audience is going to be like, hey, great, this is wonderful. I really feel like I got a satisfying journey for these innies that puts them in an entirely new mindset to go on the next part of their journey. And you're going to have another bunch of people where it's just like, this is a show about what's going on at Lumen and you answered nothing about what's going on at Lumen. How dare you? And there's no way around that. No version of this finale, unless a serious finale had happened, would have truly resolved that. But I, I think they could have thrown a breadcrumb. I think they maybe mm-hmm. could have, whether it's the ghost or something, they could have maybe felt like we moved further on that mystery as opposed to simply moving the characters closer to getting the answers we want, which is what I would argue this finale did. Yeah, I mean, it's possible they don't know yet. You know, it's possible they're still figuring, the creators are still figuring it out. I'm, I'm not, it seems based on their interviews that they do know what is going on. But yeah, they they chose to reveal like what the story is behind Heli. And a lot of people want something else. They want to know more about Lumen. I'm fine with, you know, what they did reveal. Um, but uh, people may disagree. So anyway, at the end of the Heli storyline, she kind of, we meet her father. Uh, there is some 
sort of vagueness around why she chose to undergo severance, right? Was it because she felt pressured into it? Was it because she wanted to prove her allegiance? Um, but either way, regardless of her reasoning, uh, it was going to be something very beneficial for the company that she did it, right? Like it was good PR um, and her father was very grateful uh, because it was going to help him to achieve his quote unquote revolving, which is a thing that we will talk about later. Um, so then she gets up on stage and says, we're prisoners. We hate it in there uh, before she's tackled uh, and taken off the stage. And so we will see what happens after that. I mean, I think to the point, though, like the thing with that, that storyline that really stood out to me, that like we still have no idea what kind of person Helena is, right? We know mm-hmm. from that message to her any that like she obviously is she like, has some entitlement she I think is she's co- a little bit entitled right. she is committed to this and moving through but it's like how, why does she feel she has to be that way right is it obligation to family is it obligation mm-hmm. to the company is it self-interest right like i'm not suggesting I, I, I would argue we learn a lot about her from that message okay class. i think we learn I, I think we learn a lot about the person she is choosing to be but i feel like as a reminder as always when these complicated family situations in the politics of this right like i think about how like cobell is clearly a true believer in all things Mm -hmm. here, right? We saw the shrine, we saw the sort of just like circumstance, right? But like, it's obvious that not everybody at Lumen probably is, right? Like there is a subsection of just like capitalist structure versus sort of like more dogmatic approaches that to me is operating here. So like the differences between the board as an entity and the Kier and the Egan family, right? Are those one in the same? Do they operate in the same forms? Are they aiming for the same goals, right? Like just thinking a little bit about how those forces operate through, Helena is our insight into that. And yet we still don't know like where she sits and how she Mm -hmm. feels in full about all those different elements. And so I'm not suggesting that she's like a great person and she's just like, you know, caught up in a bad situation. That's not my point. But I do feel like even though we now know much more about how he's outside life in terms of facts, we don't really know the nuance of it in the way we know Mark still. And so there's still plenty to learn about Helly and Helena. Um, and I'm curious how the show does that now that they kind of, the reveal is done and they can maybe start looking at her and Mark as some of the sort of parallel identities and lives. Let's talk a little bit about Mark's reveal, right? A lot of uh, big insights happen there. Uh, he wa- awakens at Rickon's uh, book reading party and tries to talk to his sister about what's going on. It convinces his sister that, you know, this thing is happening to him. Uh, and then discovers that his wife was actually not dead. Uh, and because he, his any knew about her from, from Lumen. This is probably like the most tense storyline. And honestly, rewatching it, it did feel a little bit contrived because... If it was me in Mark's situation, I would be like, you know, every time my sister's like, oh, actually, hold on. I got to I got to do this other thing. Oh, the book reading start. I'd be like, F the book reading. We are talking right now. OK, I, I literally could be taken away at any second. Right. Um, so that was the only part that felt like, oh, a little bit like just ratcheting up the tension for ratcheting up the tension's sake. But I, I really enjoyed the way this came together. Super tense. Uh, the reveal that he like knows what Miss Cobell's real name is, you know, a, a nice moment, well done. You you could see it coming, but like yeah. it was well executed. And there's also all these little like really hilarious moments, like when he has to share the book with that woman, and she's like, "Hey, I I have reading glasses. I need to sit really close." And also, I have like sores on the back of my. It's like, it's it's very the the whole show is done in a deadly serious tone but they drop in all these things that are like supposed to be really funny and for me i really just just that like this woman's being like really difficult it's just like what what a kind of hilarious dynamic that is even though the tone of the show is again deadly serious what did you think of this whole story i mean like i remember like early on i I noted like there's some of the lines of dialogue are just weirder than they need to be Right. They just like there's a little bit off and they kind of play through and like all of Rick and friends are just weirdos. Like when eventually <laughs> the guy who finds the baby, like Mark opens the door and finds it and he yes. rushes in. He's just like, I found it. I found the baby. I did it. And I'm like, the one who found her. I'm the one who found her. Yes. It's such a weird moment of just like undercutting. It's very like, off kilter. It's very, it's off, very kilter. off kilter. And like the whole yeah. thing of Rick and whole group, the whole lack of food thing earlier on, like the show is not interested in like providing clear answers. It just wants to disorient us. Right. It wants yes. to kind of play in those spaces. And I think this story works in that regard. I think you're right about the tension. I think the thing is, like, we have to remember, like, these innies have no conception of the outside world, and all of this is entirely new to them. And I think the show uses that here. 
as sort of like an excuse to be like, Mark doesn't know what to do because he's orienting himself to this situation and to his surroundings. I will say that the smartest thing Mark did was he's literally talking to Miss Cobell when he wakes up and he doesn't give away that he's an yeah. A. Like that, that is amazing. I would know? argue so. that in many cases it's like, and, and I don't know if that's like sort of like his like constant in that moment, um, like his ability to just be like, oh, Cobell's here. That's weird, but also I know this person, right? And so it's a right. technically a familiar face, if not a friendly one um, yeah. in that environment. Like there's just something. So like they have to walk that fine line where he needs to be able to pass as Mark for the story to continue, right? Because otherwise it yeah. ends immediately. It all kind of falls apart. Yeah. And they want to give us Frickin's reading. They want to give us the neti pot. They want to give us all these like fun little details of the story. But I do think you're right. The, tr- the effect that he goes along as he does, like the close call with Frickin in the photo. Where it's like, oh, do you happen to have that photo on you? And then they get yeah, called out I, for the neti pot. I'm like, it's Mark like would be grabbing that photo, right? Like yeah. to me, just his I, his level of restraint I mean, seems. I, I am I am grateful that the show does stuff like that, but then it eventually does. Like, what would be mad and what would be like really infuriating is if like he never got a chance to talk to his sister yeah. or he never saw the photo, right? Yeah. Like, then I'd be like kind of pissed. I'd be like, you're just playing with us, show. But it it teases us, and then it eventually does kind of give us what we're looking for i will so. say weirdly the thing about this to me is like it's so weird that we don't see him actually tell Devin, like explain it to her we just mm-hmm. come back like they finally get their time to meet when she gives the baby yeah. to cobell we cut back to a different story and then we come back and they're just chatting about what's going on i think you know in your newsletter episodic medium you point out that probably it's for pacing reasons like it just you don't want to spend five minutes of him explaining and then the, it would have been interesting from a emotional slash interpersonal level, but it's just difficult in general as a storytelling thing when you have a character telling another character stuff that the audience already knows. You know what I mean? Like that's just a difficult thing to pull off well, uh, and it's difficult to do it like creatively. And so they're already operating on all cylinders here. They have other stuff they got to deal with. They're just like he just tells her she believes him. Let's move on. I was fine with it. Yeah, but yeah, it, it does deprive us of seeing what her reaction would have been to that, right? Right, and I sort of it leads yeah. me to wonder where it's just like how quickly, like, did she grok to it? Like, did she immediately yeah. like, yeah, that makes perfect sense, or was she just like shocked? And again, that would have been like a back and forth five minutes that we didn't need to see. I, I think this choice makes sense, but I did still sort of feel like that was sort of an opportunity, but it would basically just been exposition, and we already know all that, so like, expense yeah. with it, kind of keep things moving. Um, and yeah, to your point, like, I think if they had not gotten to the reveal, if he hadn't eventually found the photo, right, if he hadn't been able to create that moment, we'd be having a very different, we'd conversation be having a very today. different conversation <laughs> where it's just like show, like, what do you think is happening right now? Um, but I do think that still, like, as with the Howie situation, it's possible, like, part of what I was really kind of like thought, thinking about is just like, how does the show reset from this? Right. Like, why do Mark and Irving and, you know, how go back to the separate floor? Well, Helen, I understand more than the others. Right. But the others, if they people in their lives know these, they are connected to this. Right. Yeah. Like, why go back? How do we go back yeah. to a normal? And I think that it's this idea. Here, let, let, let's hold let's hold off on that. Let's hold yeah, off. On well, that. Yeah, I, I want to talk about like. But what I mean yeah, by that, like, is that like with Mark and the, you know, moment is Devin going to understand what he says there? Right, I, still I think so. So I, you think that she's? she's I, I think so. There's no the, that's gonna be. There's no way she's talking about anyone else. Like, and it it would also be like a really bad. Like it would be an, again a frustrating storytelling move if like he did that and then like she's like, who are you talking about, Miss <laughs> Cobell? You know, like it's just like no, it's it's gonna she's gonna understand what he means. But I agree with you. It introduces other narrative problems. Right. Um, and I there just, is a conversation that Variety uh, Jennifer Moss over at Variety had with the creators of the show. Um, and I think what is interesting to contemplate is the implications of the uh, fact that Mark's wife is alive. Um, the question was asked of uh, the D- Dan Erickson, who's the showrunner. Any Mark has pieced together that Gemma is actually Miss Casey and is still alive, but he knows she's been fired from Lumen and sent down to wherever the elevator takes her. What can you say about why Mark and Gemma are involved in this situation to begin with? As it's clear, Lumen faked her death. And that ultimately worked out in a way that prompted Mark, not knowing any of this, to join Lumen. But it's unclear why Lumen wants them. And then D- Erickson responds, I just worry Ben Stiller is going to leap out and kill me if I say anything. There's a question of who is targeted first. Was Mark targeted because of his relationship to Gemma? Was it the other way around? And that's something we don't see this season, but we will see in subsequent seasons. 
that's the big question. What is special about Mark? And is it actually that there's something special about him? Or is it more about Gemma? And he was sort of pulled in. Those are all left unanswered this season, but we will get into it. And then uh, Jennifer asked the question to the to Dan. It's confusing why a company like Lumen would be that interested in a history professor and his Russian literature professor wife to fake her death. And then Dan Erickson responds, maybe they just really like Uncle Vanya. <laughs> <laughs> which i thought was very clever uh, yeah. but anyway so when you think about the implications of miss casey's death being faked it's like wow that really does raise a lot of other questions uh, you know like it, why did any of this happen i think it does so, again like we're gonna have to see the origins of that i think it's gonna be a sort of key piece of just sort of like moving through all this and again i think those are the types of things that like I think this episode could have hinted more at that, could have given us a new breadcrumb. Instead, I feel like we're kind of at the same place we were before in the previous episode. Um, when that twist was revealed, I feel like we haven't really gone too much past that in terms of like insight into those characters or understanding. I would argue um, that Gemma's body is definitely still alive. Um, whether Gemma still mm. is, I think is a different set of questions. Um, if I had to sort of make an argument in that respect, it's clear that he has no recollection of Mark. Uh, that she has no recollection of Mark and that as much as I wonder, like we interpreted everything that Cobell did with the tree, with the candle as an effort to test Mark's knowledge of Gemma, but it could just as easily have been testing Gemma's knowledge of Mark, right. In terms of their ability to sort of handle that. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering like, is there still an Audi Gemma that exists or has mm -hmm. they've, have they done something to effectively like the any Gemma is operating in this other consciousness, despite the fact that like Gemma's outer consciousness did in fact die, whether she was brain dead or brain damage or something moving through. Cause I feel like it, it does seem like what's happening with Gemma is different than what's happening with Mark. Um, mm -hmm. And that the idea that Lumen managed to like fake her death and kidnap her and go through all this process seems like for a Russian literature professor a lot. Right to have kind of managed it seems not, like does not seem Only like to our uneducated minds. So to me, but, I would yes. argue that like the car crash she was in might have created sort of like a medical experimentation space in which like the mm -hmm. body was you know illegally effectively taken and then experimented upon. If I had to, in terms of like the way in which and like they talk obviously about the ways in which Lumen is interconnected to this local community. Um, it seems to me like they took advantage of a tragedy with Gemma and then built from that, if I had to theorize. We do just want to mention quickly the Irving Burt storyline. To me, this one felt uh, pretty low stakes compared to everything else. Um, wasn't a, a terrible storyline or anything like that, but like um, some people have pointed out, I think you might have pointed out, he's not like interacting with anyone, so it's not like super interesting to watch. And I did find the like the Irving Burt storyline to be kind of like, I don't know. Um, it's sweet. It's very sweet what, what's going on between them, but it's not like one I was really desperate to see how it played out. And then the this, this stuff he actually does, you know, he discovers that his Audi was like tracking other severed people. So maybe he was like going inside for a specific reason, right? Um, and then he shows up at Burt's door, uh, doorstep and knocks on the door and then he then the episode ends. Um, don't know if you have anything else to say about this one, but it, it was fine. Nothing really. I, I will say with, have to with say Irving, about it. it's like I think that's the moment when he opens that trunk. We confirm that Irving is doing something with Lumen, but again, I feel like those documents could have given us some sort of hint, some sort of insight, and they don't actually yeah. tell us anything, right? It's just yeah. telling us about Irving, and I feel like that was an opportunity where maybe there was something going on there. That they could have just built a bread. They could have given us some more story yeah. details yeah. or and information. Instead, I do yeah. think it does become sort of just like this very much, you know, it's a very, you know, sweet romantic story that we know has to end in tragedy that has no happy ending. That they're like, what are we even rooting for in this situation? One of the commenters <laughs> right. as we were going through, it's like, I love this story, but I feel like it's just going to end in tragedy. I'm just so worried about them. And I'm like, mm -hmm, yeah, that's correct. Um, there is no like, <laughs> there's no, and that's the thing where it's sort of like, what, what does a happy ending look like for these innies, right? Like, what are they aiming for, right? Is it better working yeah. conditions? Is it freedom, right? Is it, you know, reintegration? Like, does the idea of what that sort of looks like? So for him to go and see, right, that he's fallen in love with this man, but this man has a life on the outside and this kind of world and these circumstances, but it's all a world that he can't imagine and has no context for. And it's just him, you know, scrambling to drive a car and move through. 
I'm invested in, in the sense that like, I care about those characters and that journey, but it felt very much like once that journey was started, it was very isolated. It wasn't really going to provide greater insight into the larger story. And so I do think that it worked maybe as the way in which the show could pace out and extend the Mark and Helly stories, which were much more tense, which were much more fraught, that to go back to Irving was a chance to catch our breath a little bit. Right. You talk, and people have talked about how like they were kind of breathless. They were really holding their breath, like on the edge of their seat. And I think the Irving stories are maybe a chance for our heart rate to come down a little bit. Um, and I do think that pacing wise, I do think that served the episode, even if I think they maybe could have been providing a bit more substance if they chose, so chose without really adjusting. Yeah. Uh, it's a good call about pacing. And, and sometimes you do need to like take a breath, you know, it can't just be like nonstop tension or else it can be overwhelming. Uh, so those are the plot lines that play out at the end of the season. You know, we've already talked about overall thoughts on, on the episode. Uh, let's talk about like unresolved mysteries, right? Uh, any big unresolved mysteries? I think the big question we've already alluded to is what does Lumen do? Roxana Haddadi over at Vulture put together a piece where she tried to argue that they, they basically do some kind of like mind replacement in the style of get out, you know, the Jordan Peele movie, um, that that's what like the revolving might be, and that the ultimate end goal is to bring back Kier in some way, like to have him live on potentially in other people's bodies. What do you think about that uh, that theory, Miles? I mean, so obviously, I think the cult like elements of that are important. I think Cobell's like evangelicism about it and the way in which she's sort of treating it and kind of moving through kind of creates that opportunity. Um, I don't know if necessarily that the idea of sort of like reincarnation and kind of moving through, I'm wondering if it's almost more of a sort of, you know, effort for those people involved. I think what to me is the biggest question, and it's like, I, I've, I've said a few times, I wrote a whole piece at one point when I was writing weekly reviews of the show about how like, it's not necessarily, how do we decide what a mystery show is, right? And how, how much do we want to turn it into one, which is to say, how much do we want to lose our entire minds? Um, trying to kind of like piece these things together and try to find answers. Um, I think that there's no question this show definitely evolved into one of those. And I think that that piece that Roxana wrote was very much, yeah, going in the direction of like, let's try to piece all these things together. What stands out to me, though, at the end of the day, is that I don't understand Lumen and the Egans and the intersections between them. Because like Cobell and her positionality within this, you know, she's not representing the board directly. They clearly sit above her and are kind of moving through. But like, are the Egans and the board the same? Like, how do we understand the political, capitalistic, sort of like mass market severance they seem to be aiming for, right? With the woman using it for her pregnancies, right? And just kind of like, it seems like they have these really big plans where everybody will be severed in one way or another. Those seem yeah. like very much like, you know, big tech, corporate America, like let's use technology. That seems like metaverse type stuff to me um, in terms of what that's doing. But then you have these cult-like elements that feel much more sort of like personal and sort of organized. And I guess to me, are those two things one in the same, right? Are those two impulses working within these goals to the same degree? Like that's where I think, I think there's no question something going on on all these levels, but there's a big picture that they kind of keep hinting at with the news stories and the mouthpiece and all these things. And then you've got the more sort of cult-like elements that we experience on the server floor itself. I'm trying to reconcile those two things and try to piece those uh, yeah, things together. I, I guess I don't see them as really distinct. And I think that's kind of one of the points that the show is making, right? Is that many workplaces in America, if you look at them from the outside, do feel like cult-like environments. And I, so I, I don't see them as like super distinct or that there's some like element, there's not like some insurgent cult aspect of it that's like, you know, threatening to take over. Like it is one and the same in my, in my opinion. I, I do think that, you know, I don't know that I feel like the show has thought through what it means to be a 100 year old tech company particularly well. Like um, not that many tech companies like last over a hundred years. Um most of the companies that last over a hundred years are breweries actually, you know, or companies that do like one thing extremely well, like make pencils or like paper or something like that. Um, so what could, what, what is like a tech company? What was the tech company doing like 80 years ago? You know, like it just, I don't know, like 
maybe the show will reveal itself to be super thoughtful in season two about this topic. But like so far, I haven't seen much evidence of it. That doesn't mean I don't like the show. I'm just like, okay, like you're not putting that much thought into that. And that's okay. Like I'm just kind of along for the ride. And I'm not I'm not thinking as deeply as you are into it, is what I have to say. Mm. I'll also just say I think Roxana's uh, theory is, is very plausible. Like, insofar as we have any theories about anything, I think it's very plausible. Yeah. Um, other mysteries unresolved, Miles, there's like the goats. What was going on with the goats? Um, what's going on in the testing floor? I don't think we ever find out like what happens in the mm, testing floor. No, right? like obviously like we know enough about like what's going on. The very idea that like, you know, what we learn about Miss Casey as an entity is that she's only been alive for as long as she's let out to do these meetings. So like it's not like she has a separate life. She's activated to complete the wellness sessions and then deactivated. Um, and I do think that that sort of gives us an insight into how they're using these people where basically they are permanent innies that can be turned on and off um, in some way. That's, that's the indication in terms of how long she'd been alive, right? The way she talked about that. And obviously the yeah. elevator goes down instead of up. So we know they're not going back to the surface, right? <laughs> so like we have a yeah. sense of, too. but no, the idea of like, and, you know, like people sort of uh, one of someone in my comments was speculating that Irving's Audi was painting the testing floor, which we saw previously, like we saw that last week. So it's not a new entire development, but um, but uh, specifically that he's testing it to try to, like, convince Irving to go investigate it or to kind of like communicate to his any, which is where the black goop is coming from and those type of things. And I think that's kind of an answer to the question of the black goop. But like the why of that, of like, how does the Audi Irving know about the testing floor? And in what ways would that help the any Irving? How would they know to look for it? Like, how would those mm -hmm. things kind of play out? I do think that like, again, you know, they could have easily included something in those files talking about the testing floor that would have like given yep. us some greater indication of that. Again, it, it was a choice. I want to emphasize like when it comes to those things, it's not that I think it's a terrible choice, but it's a very conscious one. And I know that Alan Sepinwall said when he talked about Stiller about it, that apparently Dan Erickson had wanted to reveal more in this finale. And Ben Stiller was just like, no, we need to hold Apple hostage so they will pick up a second season. You can't give them too much information. This needs to feel mm -hmm. like if the show ended right now, people would riot. And... <laughs> And I feel like this is a very risky strategy, but yes. if you're Ben Stiller and realistically, this doesn't really matter that much. You hold a lot of sway. You can make that happen, I guess. If you're Ben Stiller and also delivering us what in my estimation is two of the best seasons of television I've watched in the last, you know, five, 10 years, like Escape from Danamora and now this, uh, you get to have your creative input known, you know, like he, he directed a bunch of episodes from those seasons yeah. and they're exceptional in my opinion. So anyway, uh, any other mysteries um, miles I mean, other than the ones we mentioned that you're, you're thinking about? I mean, I think there's still, like, what does Lumen do? What are the goats? Right. Those What's things the are for? definitely like, the biggest yeah. piece of things, right? You know, everything yeah. about operation design, like all the stuff they're building. And oh, making. oh, here's a question. Here's a question for you. Um, do you think that the numbers that the people are doing were actually accomplishing anything? Because my, my wife and I were like, uh, my theory currently is that the, the numbers were not like the purpose of that whole work area was to test severance. It wasn't for those people to actually have any productivity of any kind. It was to see if severance would work. That was my operating theory and nothing in the finale disproved that theory. Um, it's possible we could find out actually the numbers do this, but like, I, I think it's possible that they do nothing. I don't know if you have an, a, an opinion on it right now. My, my thing is sort of like, I, I definitely think it's obviously it's not just numbers or something going on. I think the idea that it's a training exercise for them to recognize something that's scary, that it's sort of like whatever the severed state is in their ability to identify and distinguish mm. between different feelings or something that seems to be in some way part of that. Right. Mm, Whether it's doing yeah. something, it does seem like them doing it is achieving some sort of goal. But like the part of it that's confusing to me is like you have Cobell and Milchik, like, you know, on the edge of their seat, waiting to see if Heli gets to 100 percent completion in time for the end of the quarter. And you still have the board coming down like quarterly results still matter. Right. And like part of me is like it's all part of the experiment. Right. It's all part of just the psychological testing of these innies and just like the part torture, part control. Like, how can we manage all these things? I'm certainly open to those ideas. But the idea of whether they completed it mattered in a way that did sort of make me wonder if there's something else just kind of like that's going on there. 
I think they've left the door open to that. I would tend to agree with you that I'm not I'm not convinced that that's actually like an important task. I think we're pretty clear mm-hmm. at this point that this is very much a you know rats in a maze type mice in a maze type, type <laughs> right, situation. Right. Um, but I do feel like that there's still that open possibility that there's also something that they need done that they specifically of how their programming severance is giving them the ability to see and do. I loved the season one finale of Severance. I thought it, the whole season was exceptional. Really enjoyed the show. But I do think that the finale leaves them in a really tough spot for season two. Because you have grown attached to these characters, both mostly the innie versions, to some degree the outie versions. And the status quo that the season one finale leaves it in is there is no reason anyone in their right mind would ever allow the innies to be reactivated, right? Like, Heli has completely sabotaged the entire severance process. Adam Scott's character was already thinking of quitting even without the situation, like, without his um, innie coming to life in his body, you know? Like, why would the innies ever be allowed to continue existing at all, let alone interact with each other? You know, it just... I'm worried they're going to have to go through like these extreme plot contortions to make it so that these characters a survive as any forms and B are put together again. What do you think? I mean, I think we can break this down in a few ways. So it's obvious to me that Irving at, knew that he was going in there as some sort of experiment, right? That he was trying to prove a point. So like, there's two questions. One is why would they let the Indians continue on? Like, why would they continue the experiment? And that to me depends on like why they were doing it in the first place right? How important it is that Lumen doesn't fail, that the way in which they kind of need to commit to these things is very clear. Um, So if they don't go back as innies, that happens from there. But it's also like, why does, like, why would Mark go back, right? Like, why would he go back to this knowing what's going to happen and what could face his innie? Well, he he has a reason uh, in that his, like, he knows his he will find out both Audi and any Mark will find out that his wife is alive. So yeah. maybe there's some argument. He's going to go like infiltrate yep. Lumen to like get his wife out. Like, so that, that one is less c- right. confusing to me. It's more the heli like, yeah. Or is, is this the end of the road for heli's character as an any, you know what I mean? Like, I, and I mean, obviously they, at this point, they literally conceive of heli's any as a separate person. Like her father's like, what that any did to you, you know, I can't yeah. stomach it's it. Like, like it's it's like her sister, right? Is how right. they describe. They it. think of her as a different person. Why would they ever allow that person to be alive again, unless it was like under terrible pain or circumstances, which Patricia Arquette's character promises, by the way. And so, you know, yeah, I think there's sort of a sense of just like what the next stages for Lumen is definitely sort of the bigger question, um, the bigger sort of mystery. Um, I wish I had a clear answer to that, um, and I don't know that they can generate one quite too consistently or two in context, but definitely a lot to sort of unpack and sort of engage with under those circumstances. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts on season two or a- anything you're looking forward to or your hopes? I'm, I'm looking hopes, forward. dreams, uh, fears. I'm looking forward to that mystery. Um, I will say that for me, like, I think that there's a lot to unpack there. I think the uncertainty of that. And I think, look, I think this finale bought them a lot of goodwill, to be honest with you. Um, mm-hmm. I think that the way they pulled this off, the way they executed it, the consistency of the production design, I'm really excited to return to this world, but I'm also, to your point, deeply uncertain about what that looks like and wondering sort of like with the status quo blown up like it is, do they spend more time on the Egans and on their other lives? We still technically don't know what Dylan's Audi right is or why he did any of these things they've left Dylan's story is by far the least developed his any goes on a very quick journey where it used to be all about perks and then he just like wakes up and like shows how quickly it can turn if you just know more about that outside life and kind of gain that insight um so we still have Dylan's story there's still things with Irving of understanding how he got to where he is right I think there's a lot of story they can still tell But then I'm like, okay, you could maybe adjust the format for a second season and play around with these details and kind of keep things like flashbacks and like different pieces to kind of make that work. But like, what does season three look like in that circumstance, right? How far can they take this, right? It's not a miniseries. There's definitely more story to tell, but like it it has to be finite. Like there has to be like some sort of you, like end we, game we want there to be a plan and a, like an end point that they're driving at that's that's what we as viewers want ideally in this situation 
with this many mysteries. Yes. You know what would be the biggest power move of all time, Miles, is if you started season two and it's like a completely different story mm-hmm. of like multiple different characters that are taking place simultaneous with the events of season one. Uh, yeah. That would be, they could pull like a Saw 3 or a Saw 4 or whatever. And like, hey, the story is happening at the same time as season one. That would be like the biggest power move, I think. Here's a new. Just answer none of the questions from season one. Well, I mean, I think what you could theoretically do is introduce a new department, right, of severed individuals. Yes. Where you do yes. get more insights into the severed floor, into the management characters, into those different pieces, and find a way to accomplish that. I do think, again, that would be a huge problem because the whole reason why this finale is so resonant. The whole reason it works is because of how invested we are in the any stories and how the journey that they've come to and that now they're finally ready to fight. It's very much a story of like unionization and worker solidarity of yeah. just like realization of collective value. And like the like Dylan, when like he's try holding the things apart and he looks over at the cube for motivation as like, who is he doing this for? Right. And it's his coworkers, right. It's his fellow worker that they've banded together. That he's giving up all of this, taking this risk for them. That is the powerful statement here. And if we just abandon these innies and don't come back to them and don't like fight for them, I think that doesn't work. We're not going to kind of have that same insight. And so it's sort of like, in some ways, they've that part of the show is working so well. If they were to just go back and be like, oh, we're going to go just dive into the mysteries of the seventh floor more and give you answers there, we're then missing the emotional connection. And I think that exactly, those two things know- need to coexist. A lot of people want the mysteries to be resolved. Like, honestly, the mystery is the least interesting part of the show for me. Like, the most interesting part of the show is you have this tightly knit group of workers. You introduce an external factor to it. Uh, It causes chaos. And also the characters, like, start reforming different relationships with each other. Like, all those interpersonal dynamics, that's what's interesting about the show to me. That's, That's the heart of the show. And like you said, this idea of, like, unionization and workers, you know, realizing their collective power. Like, that, that part is the interesting part. Um, not like what this weird ass company is doing. You know, I don't really particularly care personally, but you know, people like what they like on their TV shows. So. Well, and I think also like I, I'm, I'm not a mystery show person. Um, when I was writing about it, I talked about, I remember like watching Westworld's first season and just seeing the internet so quickly, just be like, it's all about what's going on. And I'm just like, okay, like, I, yeah, I get it. I, well, that show really embraced And that, I will say, by, by the end of that first season of Westworld, <laughs> I'm like, okay, no, this show is literally just trying to build a giant puzzle box um, in its context. <laughs> I think with Severance is that part of it, it's that it was so much just like, you know, these early episodes really just were not giving us any context. We're just seeing bits and pieces, right? The I think to me, in some ways, I think the Baby Goats episode is the one that maybe broke things a little bit. Because it literally mm-hmm. is just like Mark and Helly roaming around the halls, running into stuff they don't understand. Um, and then we don't. And, and really... it just kind of feels like we're just going to throw in weird stuff just right. to like mess you up and, and discombobulate even you. Even if it and does it, have yeah. a specific meaning, it just felt like they were just like welcoming us into that. Right. It was a siren song of just like, look, mm-hmm. look at the baby goats. Right. Look at what this means. Just think, what could the baby goats be? Whereas the previous episodes were just kind of unnerving and uncomfortable and allowing us to sort of like see the dystopia and kind of connect to it that way. I agree. It's not my primary framework, but I do think that they did too much to make it seem like one like this. I don't think fans did this to severance. I don't think they took a show that wasn't trying to be a Reddit mystery show and turned it into one. But I think that there is a justification for the sense that the show was promising a certain type of narrative approach and closure that was simply not happening in this finale for reasons that we've talked about the other thing i wanted to mention by the way is uh you, we, we talked briefly about dylan i think it's revealed that he has like two more kids so like three kids total well milchick tells him that whether that's true or not yeah Mil- milchick tells him and uh it is a really powerful moment when he's like i i want to remember my kid being born uh and you realize kind of the full weight of how terrible the situation with these um these innies is and there's a very hilarious line where Milchik offers him coffee cozies and paintball as other perks uh it's like <laughs> what a random assortment of things anyway i do think there's something about this idea like whatever that handbook says like from Milchik's perspective which again i feel like i kept i imagined like we would just get a Milchik episode in season two that's just like what is his what does his daily life look like i would love it cause because he's such he's such a tremendous 
uh, perform. It's such a pre- tremendous performance in this episode, right? So. And like just the way, or, he, or in general, yeah. I think, in but general, like, obviously, season, like the yeah. defiant jazz moment is like a definitive sort of like moment that kind of speaks out in those circumstances. But like, I'm thinking about it particularly because what Milchik represents is this person kind of trapped where he's executing these things, but like we don't know if he's really a true believer, right? Is he just an employee? Like, how does this play out? But it's this idea that like he has this like handbook of like all the potential perks. It's like in a moment of crisis, what perks are you supposed to offer them? And the idea he's just like working with that. And like, surely if he is not severed, he should understand that that is an absurd thing to say, (laughs) right? But like (laughs) what psychology are they operating under to believe that those are the two things, right? Like that, right. you know, those are the next two steps where it's just yes. like, you know, after we leave the finger traps, right, you know, we got to go rate the coffee cozies and like, you know, but like, again, like paintball, is that like the equivalent to the like music experience? Is that the next step? Like the idea that there is actually like some sort of psychologist at Lumen who has like built this system of incentives, right. I think does raise like, I want to meet those people, right? I want to know, I want to see that conversation in context. Here's the ultimate question I have about Severance is I think that the creators of the show, Darren Erickson and Ben Stiller, have basically pulled off a heist because they've created a socially trenchant show about people who work at a longstanding tech company where when you look at it overhead, it looks like a giant ring where there's tons of secrecy and an almost cult-like following for its founder and where they use a very clean sans serif font with uh, black text on white background a lot of the time in their design aesthetic. Uh, and they got Apple to fund it. Pretty mm-hmm. amazing, don't you think? I think it's amazing. I do think one thing, and like you sort of mentioned earlier, I think sort of something worth considering, like the idea is Lumen is currently a tech company. Has it always been a tech company? Right. Mm. Like it has this sort of company town aesthetic, obviously history, like the stuff that, um, you know, Cobell had in her shrine sort of spoke to like these almost like fairs and carnivals and the sort of the idea that they built out of this town that it's sort of always just been sort of like this community built around this business. And so part of me wonders if it's sort of just inherently adaptive, that it's sort of done whatever it needed to do to sort of be a dominant business force at a given moment in time. Um kind of stood out to me as sort of being a big part of that. So I'm just wondering, like, is its ascendance into a tech company simply a matter of circumstance or has it always been sort of trying to work towards these type of goals? That's, again, the history of that company is very much unclear. All right. On that note, I think we can wrap it up. Miles McNutt writes the Episodic Medium newsletter over on Substack. Check it out at episodicmedium.substack.com. This has been our conversation about Severance Season 1. Miles, thank you so much for chatting with me, man. Absolutely. No, thank you for having me. And like that, I'm excited to see what season two brings, despite all the uncertainties that you rightly point out. All right, that's going to do it for us today. I hope you enjoyed the chat. If you liked it, be sure to hit like and subscribe, hit that bell icon. And again, reminder to check out Miles' Substack, episodicmedium.substack.com. I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you so much for watching. I want to give a huge shout out to all of my patrons at patreon.com slash Dave Chen. Uh, Y'all are who make my work possible. Um, So I really appreciate you. And if you want to support the work that I'm doing here on this channel or on any of my other podcasts, uh, check out patreon.com slash Dave Chen. Thanks so much. See you in the next one.